go in. That is the and it's abused. <laughs> I'm doing it. So I've got the, um, let's take a little. Morning crew and welcome to the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Now, I had a long day's filming yesterday with Tool Girl Sam, but today is now Sunday and I'm all on my own. But it gives me a chance to have another look at the MR2. And if you've watched the first video, we have a problem. Basically, uh, the car, the engine, every now and again will just stall out. It's as if it's just been turned off. Uh, there are no fault codes. Now, about a year ago, uh, we had a very similar problem with this car, but it flagged a fault code. And I, I don't have a scan tool, so I was able to retrieve the fault code using the flash codes. That's the engine warning. Uh, the management light on the dash will flash in a certain sequence once you trigger that, uh, that system on the vehicle by connecting a couple of pins on the diagnostic plug. And we did some work, some investigation work on the ignition system on the vehicle. And it was, you know, we found a couple of loose connections and we fixed it. And it was working fine. It did a few thousand kilometers. Uh, and then uh, my wife bought a new car. She's got a brand new Suzuki Swift. And of course, the MR2 just got parked. Then I, it ran out of warranty fitness. So I got it started up and was about to do some work on it for the warrant. And this is when this second problem came along. And it made a, a as the, just before the engine stalled, it made a really loud squealing noise, which to me sort of indicates there's an issue with the fuel pump. Maybe the fuel pump seized up. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, it lost fuel pressure and the engine stalled. And that was my sort of gut instinct. But as we saw during the first video on this repair that I did last week, uh, it really isn't a fuel pump problem as in fuel pressure. The pump works when it's told to work. However, the first thing that I spotted was the rev counter's not working. But it hasn't been working for a very long time. So, okay, maybe that's not a related problem. What I also noticed uh, on pretty much all the Japanese cars that I've worked on um, previously is when you turn the ignition on for the first time, the fuel pump will prime. It doesn't. When you go to crank, then the fuel pump primes. That sounds a bit odd. And it, that's the same even if you dump all the pressure in the fuel rail, because we've got the fuel pressure gauge on there so we can do that very easily. Turn the ignition on when there's zero pressure in the fuel rail and the pump still doesn't prime. It's only when you come to crank does the pump prime up. Uh, and the, the fuel pressure that we get once the pump's primed is within spec. So, it leads me to believe that it's not a fuel pump problem. If it is, I do have a brand new fuel pump in stock. So I'll give you the part number for that now because, you know, we may never actually fit it. Just hang on a second. Okay, right, so the fuel pump that I picked up was supplied by uh, an ex-student of mine who works for Coastal Automotive or East Coast, yeah, Coastal Auto Spares, that's right, over at Silverdale. Nathan, cheers mate. And we ordered this in, really just in case to be honest, and unfortunately it is made in China. Hmm. This one was made in October 2015 batch. Wow, okay. So that's the part number, and it's made by Fuel Miser, whoever the hell they are. Never heard of them. And in this kit, all you get are the fuel pumps inside the fuel tank, and they're a real pain to fit on these things, to be honest. You get the fuel pump, and you get a new sock filter with all the bits and pieces. Oh, and you get something else. I was quite surprised about. You get a sticker. Things go faster with stickers, so it must be a good fuel pump. I don't know. And chances are, it's never going to get fitted now. So Nathan, that might be coming back to you. And I'll be expecting a refund. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so 
the first thing that flagged a point to me, put the, put, put the rev counter to one side and the fact there's no fault codes. Fuel pump doesn't prime when the ignition's turned on, and I think it should do. And when the engine was cold, so the first start, the engine fired up and we were able to drive the vehicle down and park it in the carport just outside the workshop. So the, the car was running, the engine was running for at least two or three minutes. And then just as we were reversing the car up, the problem showed itself, which was great. It's all captured on camera and the engine stalled. And then from that point on, the engine would fire whilst being cranked and it would run, it would you know, be two or three revolutions, it would fire and then it would stall out. Um, and then, of course, you could crank it again, then it would fire again, and then it would stall out. So, I did try a little test where I continued to crank even once the engine had fired up. Still stalled. Hmm. Okay. So, what I want to do now, and this is based on the fact there are no fault codes, is to see if a feed, one of the battery feeds, the ignition feeds, power feeds, that's the word, one of the power feeds to the ECU, which will come from the ignition barrel, uh, is still present, or it is present, after cranking. Because it may well be that the ECU is just powering down as soon as you finish cranking, or it's momentarily powered up. Um, so I want to decide, is it a decision of the ECU to stop the engine, or is there really a fault? If there was a fault, I would expect a fault code, and there aren't any. So what I want to do is look at injector pulse. Are we getting an injector pulse? Now we must be getting something of an injector pulse because the engine does fire so therefore it's getting some fuel but then it stops very very quickly it's only a, an instantaneous fire um, and if we are getting an injector pulse let's also see if we can get in an ignition pulse to the uh, igniter pack as well and if those two simultaneously stop then it has to be an ECU feed problem I think but hey if Ivan was here He'd have this fixed in five minutes. I'm not Ivan. I don't do that kind of stuff every day. I do more mechanical stuff. So when it comes to diagnostics like this on cars, it's a bit different for me at least. Okay, so we'll head outside. And um, so the first test, I think we will check for an injector pulse. And we're going to use the oscilloscope for that, that Pico scope that I have. So we'll get that rigged up. Before we do, the car's been stood a week. Let's see if it starts. Now, I won't run it until it demonstrates its problem, maybe two or three minutes or whatever. It may have the problem immediately, I don't know. But we'll just see if it starts. If it does, then maybe if we get the uh, oscilloscope fired up, then we're going to be able to capture a reasonable duration of injector pulse before potentially those pulses stop. I don't know. OK, crew, here we go. Right, first job is to reconnect the battery because I disconnected it before we finished yes, uh, last week. Bloody alarms, I hate them. Right, let's get the earth put back on again. Okay, let's see if this thing fires up and stays running. Well, the wind's picking up. Sorry about the uh, potential bad sound quality. Okay, let's get it fired up. Let's see if it runs. Bloody good. Okay, so we've got the same issue as uh, we had last last uh, video, where on cold start she runs. Okay, well I think given the wind out here, I'm going to put the car in the garage because it's only a little car. We should be able to get most of it in the garage at least. Oh. Shut up, alarm. Okay. Let's see if we can get in the garage. Rev 
counter does work a little bit. It's massively under-reading the RPM there. Cool. Engine management lights come on. So, let's get a flash card. That'd be a good idea. Might just be able to coast it in the garage. Uh, wish me luck. Jeez, no brakes. One chance. Oh, it's uphill. It's good in gear. You see, it fires, doesn't it? Okay, a bit more. <laughs> right, that'll do. Okay, looks like we've got a fault code, finally. So, uh, let's take a look at the manual and see how to trigger the onboard flash codes because I can't remember it's over a year ago so diagnosis system check engine warning light right how to get output of diagnostic codes here we go this is what I want to obtain the output of diagnostic codes proceed as follows battery voltage over 11 volts well we know that because it was disconnected from last week and it was about 12.6 I think um, throttle body fully closed, so don't press the throttle down. Uh, transmission in neutral, yes. Accessory switch is off. Engine at normal, printing temperature. Well, we can't do that bit, can we? Turn the ignition switch to on. Do not start the engine. Using special tool, connect terminals TE1 and E1 on the diagnostic plug under the bonnet. Right, let's go and do that. Okay, so we've got the little cap again, where we've got the, the key to what the uh, each terminal does. And we want TE1, which is, get one of my little pointers, if you can see it or not. It's that one, just there. And then we want E1, which is that one there, look. So, on the plug, it's that one and that one. So, I'll pop that one in there. And we'll stick that one in there, Let's give it a bit of a bend because it's dropping down, there we are, right, so we're seeing a jumper wire now, okay, stick that on there, that on there, right, let's go and turn on the ignition and see what we get, right, ignition on, okay, that's one, second number, four, let's do it again, Okay, first number, one, big gap, one, two, three, four. Okay, fault code 14, let's go and look it up. Okay, just to uh, run through these flash codes in a bit more detail so you know what you're looking for, if we just scroll up, you'll see we've got the check engine one now flashing, and it's usually a two-digit diagnostic code and the first number of that pair of digits uh, it says here in the event of a malfunction the light will blink every half a second the first number of blinks will equal the first digit of the two-digit diagnostic code and after one and a half second pause the second number of blinks will be equal to the second number if there are two or more codes there will be a two and a half second pause between each code after all the codes have been signaled here a signal there will be a four and a half second pause and they will all be repeated as long as the terminals TE1 and E1 of the diagnostic connector are connected, shorted together. Okay, right, so we got a one and a four on our code, so we need to know what one four fourteen stands for. What does it represent? Here we go. Right, now we don't need to do cancel anything at the moment. 14, there we are. No IGF signal to ECU. Huh, okay. So, no IGF signal. 
Ooh, this sounds very promising now, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, igniter or ignition coil circuit, igniter and ignition coil or the CU. Well, this is what I'm sure this is what we had last time. See page FI45. FI45. Okay, so let's have a, a scan down and have another read of that then. Right, so a little look. Okay, so FI45, there's our wiring diagram, pretty basic. And it's telling us the first thing we need to do is check that there is no voltage between the ECU terminals IGT and E1. And if we look on there, it's going to be the first one bottom right on the largest plug. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, six from the right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, for IGT, because they're not labeled up. Right, let's get a voltmeter. Now, the, the one thing it does say is the engine needs to be idling. We can't do that. But we can turn the ignition on and we'll see if we get a voltage. Right, Mr. ECU, these are mounted in the, in the boot on these MR2s. So we were looking at that pin there and then six along. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Back probe into that white wire there, look. And we'll stick one on that first pin there, look, as well. We can get in. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay. Right. Ignition on. Hmm. Okay. I'll try and start it. Now, did we see a voltage? Better check the footage. Well, looking at the footage, we did see a voltage just momentarily while the engine was running before it stalled out. That's bad. The manual tells us we shouldn't see a voltage. Okay, let's go and do test number two. Right, so test number two. Check there is, there is voltage between the ECU terminal IGT and the body ground. Again, when idling, well, we can attempt to start the engine and we'll try and capture a, um, a voltage on the screen. Okay, so IGT terminal, which is that one there, and ground. Right, so we'll just swap across these. We'll put positive on the IGT terminal and got a ground just over on the firewall. On there, that should work. Okay, well, I'll go and turn the ignition on, we'll see what we get. Nothing. Right. Let's give it a crank. <laughs> Wonderful things, cameras. Let's just play the footage back. So we did see a small voltage, and it was climbing, but it wasn't running for very long, was it? Okay, so we did see a voltage on that one. That's a pass. Right. Let's go and see what's next. So I also want to check, do test number three which is this one here, where we check E1, which is an earth wire, and ground, and see if we get any kind of resistance value for that. It should be very, very low resistance, really. Okay, so we've done tests one and two. Let's do test three now. So E1 to ground, so E1, doesn't matter on the leads this time around, is that one, and ground, just on the side of the firewall again. What do we get? Ah, overall, 0.5 of an ohm. So we know that the earth, the grounding of the ECU is fine. Excellent. Okay, quick recap. So test one was a fail. We got voltage and there shouldn't be voltage. We got uh, voltage on number two where there should be voltage. So that was a pass. And we've just checked the grounding um, 
wiring between the ECU, Terminal E1, and the body ground, and I believe that that was a pass. It was very low ohms. I think it went down to about 0.3 just before I disconnected everything. Okay, so now it says to check fuses and the fusible links and the ignition switch and the ignition main relay. So, if we just go back up to the wiring diagram, we've got here fuse AM2. Now, I have no idea where fuse AM2 is, so we're going to have to find out. So let's go down to body electrical. And hopefully somewhere on here it's going to tell us. So we should have some breakout of the fuse boxes somewhere down here. So relay blocks, relay block number five is under the bonnet, relay block number two is in the engine bay. Okay. So we're looking for AM2 fuse, which should be a seven and a half amp. What have we got on there? Oh, there we go, look. Right, so we've got number 11 is fuse AM2, 7.5 amps. So number 11, that one there. And that's in relay block number 5. I think from memory that was under the bonnet, wasn't it? Relay block number 5, under the bonnet. Right, let's go and find that fuse. And then we can test it so that's should be labeled up shouldn't it four from the bottom three from the top right back to the car so this is the fuse box under the bonnet oh i have to kneel down here i think right and am2 is four down so that's that one there okay so a little We'll gander at that one. That looks fine to me. I don't see your problems at all. But we will just check it. So we'll put it on continuity. And we want to make a beep so you can hear what's going on. Stick that on there. One, two. Okay, so that fuse is good. Right, we also need to check to see if we're going to get a voltage. Uh, on that part of the circuit. So I'll go and turn on the ignition and then we'll take some readings. Right, so we need a ground. There's our voltmeter. Put that on there for a ground. Very convenient metal bracket there. Excellent. Okay, so. Oh uh, yeah, 12.69, sorry, 11.69, and nothing. Okay, cool, that's fine then. So that's our input feed, and that's the output. Okay, I'll send the ignition off, put the fuse back in. Oh, upside down. <laughs> yes, doesn't matter either, does it? There we go. Okay. Right, I'll stick the cord back on for now. Right, so fuse AM2 seems to check out just fine. So let's go back up to the diagnostic system. And, geez, we were on. Oh, onto that one. FI45, wasn't it? There we go. Okay, so what else have we got? Well, we've got the ignition switch. Just here, look. So AM2 feeds that ignition switch. And we get a feed out on IG2, which should then power up, connect to the main ignition relay. I have a sneaky suspicion if that wasn't working, it wouldn't be running at all. Anyway, okay, so let's find the ignition main relay. That's our next mission. Right, so we'll go back to body electrical. Ignition switch might be on there, might it? B10. We need to find the ignition main relay. 
So maybe it'll tell us in those boxes again, won't it? Okay. Right. Fuses relays. Well, there's a ignition relay. So this is in block number two. So this is the one that's under the bonnet. Relay block two. No, sorry, one under the in the engine bay. So relay block two, and we're looking for the ignition relay, which is A. So it's that top corner there. Right, let's go and check that out. <clears throat> right, so this is the engine compartment fuse box. And looking at the lid as well, we've got the ignition main relay here. So pull that out, hopefully, in one piece. There we go. Okay. And we should get power on one of these two pins here, look. So I'll go and turn the ignition on and we'll check. Okay, right, onto volts and range. There we go, look. Okay, Let's see if you can see that. Perfect. Okay, so we need a ground, we'll just use the engine for that. And not a lot. 11.98. So we've got battery voltage and a residual voltage. Okay, so we're definitely getting a feed up to that. Okay. So I think the next step is to go and bench test this relay. Okay, before we do that, we need to find out what the trigger side of the circuit is, what the two pins that create the trigger, so if we put that back onto ground we should get a voltage on one of the three small ones, there's a 12 volts on that one okay so that's our feed in one of these two should be an earth okay, let's find out which one so now if we put that's our live And put our negative onto there. There we go, 12. Ah, okay, I'm getting voltage on both of those two as regards the ground. Okay, so just looking at the relay now, relay goes in like that. So that pin there is the feed in for the trigger circuit. Jeez. We'll just mark that there, look. Cool. Gives us a good start. Right, to the bench. Okay, so just looking at the wiring diagram for this particular relay, we can see here we've got our main power feed in. That's the heavy 40 amp feed, which will be one of the large terminals. And then we've got the feed out to the ignition system, which is going to be the other large terminal. Now when the relay is deactivated, then the, the feed that goes to the ignition is put to ground. And that's why we're getting a ground on that pin, as well as a ground on the trigger circuit side here, look. When the relay is activated, that ground will disappear. Okay, shouldn't be a problem then. So if we put positive to here, and we know which pin that one is on the relay, and we put a positive feed onto here, it shouldn't cause any problems at all. So we'll just try those other two pins, the 12 volt feed, and on one of them, the will hear the relay click, and that's when this switch flicks across. Once that's done, we can do some further tests and check for continuity across this large switch here, the two main pins. Right, we know where we're going now. One relay. Right, we need some power, so we're gonna get that from our bench power supply, which is turned off at the moment and we know for sure that pin there is the positive feed when the ignition switch is turned on that gets positive 12 volts battery voltage and one of these two pins goes to ground and the other one is when the ignition system the output of this relay is put to ground okay so we'll get our negative 
and we'll just turn the power supply on and we'll just make sure it's about 12 volts there we go okay so if we go onto there onto that pin oh there we go look nothing on the middle pin so the outer two pins the outer two small pins are the trigger circuit okay so let's mark that up So the white is our trigger. Okay. So that's plus, minus, and that's trigger. Put that across the top, look. Cool. Okay. Now, we also know that one of these two pins is the main feed in the permanent live. So I'll go and mark that next. Right, so ignition's on. I've already tested this but I forgot. So one of these two pins is permanent live. Not that one. That one there, look. Okay. The one nearest the camera, just down here. And if we get the relay, that sits in there like that, which means that that pin is battery voltage. That's the, that's the main feed. Cool. So we need to feed that one positive, battery feed, and we also need to go onto that one as well. So we'll get a little jumper wire because it's only a, a low current level. We'll go off there and we'll go onto that pin. Right, we now need our multimeter. We'll get that one. That can go on to the output of the trigger circuit. It's all getting a bit messy now, isn't it? Need some smaller clips. See, what, see what we've got. Okay, use that one. Look, it's a bit smaller, isn't it? Okay, we'll just whack that onto ground. Right. So when the relay is not actuated. We should have the power feed, sorry, we should have the output, which is this one here, continuous to that centre small pin. So we can check that with a continuity tester. Right, continuity. Okay, select, there we go. Quick test. Right, so with the relay currently not actuated, there's no, the power supply is currently turned off. We can pop that probe onto there, and that one onto there. Cool. Now if we turn the relay, turn the power supply on, relay is now triggered, we should get no continuity. Cool, that works. And while it's turned on, we can test now for 12 volts on that pin. So we'll go on to voltage. There we go. We need a ground. We can use that. Jeez, nearly. Can use that as the ground and we can go off that pin there look hey presto we've got voltage fantastic so that relay is working just fine super right we can check the wiring as well for a couple of these pins so we should be getting a good ground on both that's our feed for the trigger circuit, and these two here should be grounds. So we'll just pop that onto the engine block, get a good, good ground, and we should get continuity on that one. Yeah, it's pretty low umbrage, still going down. Okay, 13 ohms, and on that one, what have we got? about the same, a bit less, 10 ohms. Okay, well, all that wiring seems to be just fine, I reckon. Right, let's take a look and see what's next. So we've checked the fuse, uh, fusible links, and the ignition main relay. What we haven't checked is the ignition switch itself, but we are getting current feed. So I think that's fine, we can discount that, I think. Okay, now it says to go on to checking the distributor. See page IG9. Right. 
IG9, what the hell's that? Let's have a look. Ignition system, there we go. Right, IG9. IG4, IG8. G8, IG9, inspection of distributor. Now remember, I have already pulled this out, I actually did a bench test on it, and we got an oscilloscope reading as well. But we can also check some resistances again. So it's asking us to check G1 to G, which is 140 to 180 ohms, G2 to G, same, and NE to G, 180 to 220 ohms. Hmm. That's, I remember right, that's really hard to get to. Okay, that'll be fun. Right, the distributor is here on the engine, and uh, I think we're going to take the distributor cap off, because unfortunately the plug that we need to get to is right underneath the distributor. So I'll take the, take the cap off, and then I'll probably mark the position of the distributor under the, uh, the clamping bolts, so we can rotate the base of the distributor and bring that plug right at the top where we can get to it. All right, let's see if we can get in down here, look. Not much to see, people. Okay, that's one bolt. Where's the second one? Much easier, I think. Yeah, we've got a little extension right now. This car is covered in cobwebs. Let's get rid of that pipe. Remind me to put that back on again, people. Because I'm a damn hand at forgetting stuff. Cool. Nice and loose now. Right, so it should be possible now to remove the king lead and we can get that cap completely out of the way. Sealant. Okay, little flat screwdriver. Great stuff. Right, what have we got? Well, there's the rudder arm and it tells us to remove that, so maybe it's just a pull off one. Maybe it's got a screw in the middle. Or two screws actually, if I remember rightly. It has, it's got two screws, I can't remember what they were. Let's use the camera and take a look. Easy. Right. I'm going in. 
want to see actually having cameras around is pretty useful actually. Right. Jesus Christ. I hate alarms. Where's my magnet? Okay, we're going in. Brilliant. One more screw. Ooh. Very cool. Right, we're out to around. Come off now. Okay. It only goes in one position, so it was in the right place. We're still doing a good job there, Andy. Okay. So what clamps that into place? I have got a terrible memory. Is. So that's the plug we want down there, but I want to bring it round to the top so I can get to it. Okay, so we need to mark where the distributor is at the moment because it is adjustable. Okay, so we'll get a paint pen and we'll mark that somehow, somewhere, it's obvious. Okay, I'm going to mark that just there in line. With the bolt. Now it's not particularly accurate because it's quite a bit of an air gap, but it'll work. It'll be a starting point at least. Okay, so the bolt to undo the distributor is a 14 and it's right up here, top left, sort of about 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock on there. Okay. Yeah, it's not the world's greatest angle, but anyway. Cool. That was tight. I believe I'm taking the distributor out for a second time. Okay, cool. Retaining bolt is out. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I might as well just take it out, really. Take it out and measure it on the bench. Practically there anyway, aren't we? Right, let's unplug that. There we are. Plug looks really good, no crusties in there. Right, distributor should now come out. This is another bolt. Oh, there is. Down the bottom. Get that seal out of the way too. Okay, one more bolt. And a slightly shorter extension bar. Right, I'm running out of fingers now. Second bolt, same length, and I've just noticed, I've just pulled the vacuum line apart, so I'll stick that back together now, because I want to forget. Right, Mr. Distributor, you're coming out. There we go. I just get a bit, a bit tight on the row rings sometimes. 
Right, distributor is coming out. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to put another mark on there because it looks like it could be 180 out on this. Let's put another mark just there. Just to be sure. Okay, let's go and test those resistances again. Okay, okay. Right, so we've got the plug here, and we'll put our meter onto ohms range. Ohms, cool. Okay. And the first test is G1 to G negative. So G negative, by the looks of it, is that terminal there. That's G negative. And G1 is that one just there. So we should have between 140 and 180 ohms. Let's see what we get. 160.6 okay so we'll just write that down 160.6 ohms g2 to g minus so uh, g minus and g2 is next to that one oh. 161.160.8 no, there's damn it the same and now we're going for NE to G negative. NE is the end one. G negative. We should get between 180 and 220. Okay, 199.5. 199.5 ohms. Okay, now there was one other check that I want to do whilst we've got the distributor off. Okay, so we'll check the resistance of all those three windings. And uh, what I also want to do while we've got the distributor off, because it's dead easy to do, is I want to double check that air gap. And uh, basically, between the pickup and the rotor, there should be an air gap of 0.2 to 0.4 mil. So we can use a uh, feeler gauge for that. Right, so we'll go and mount it in the vise. And we'll take a measurement. Right, so it's 0.2 to 0.4 for the air gap. So this is 0.2. And there's plenty of clearance there. So let's try 0.4. There we go. No, too big. Right, 0.3, middle of spec. Nope. 0.25 then. Yeah, just. Okay, so the air gap's bang on. Well within spec, 0.25. No problems. Okay, so on this distributor, there's actually three pickups. We've got one here, we'll just check the air gap on. And there's two more. One here and one here. One's the G1 pickup, one's the G2 pickup. And you'll see there's a little lump on the rotor there, look. So as it goes around, it's going to induce a little tiny voltage. So we need to measure the clearance, the air gap, between each of those two as that rotor passes it. And I, you told to say you've got to use a special tool for this, which basically is a really small feeler gauge. Now fortunately, I've got my Yamaha ones from years ago, which are really good, and that's the part number there, look. Special tool, 01399. And they're as cheap as chips, and they're really useful. Right, so we'll get it set up in the vise um, so that you can see what's going on, and we'll give those two a measure as well. Fingers crossed, they're going to be in spec. Hope so. Right, so we'll go in with a 0.2 first, which is about yeah that one there. Look, 
Okay. So we'll just rotate that little lug is opposite. It's not easy because it's magnetic down there, so we'll maybe just thread it through and then we'll bring that little lug back. Yeah, there's no no massive you know grip on that one. Still a bit of clearance. Yeah, easy. Okay. Right, so we'll do the side round while we've got the, the point two out. And yep, yeah, again plenty of clearance. Okay, have we got a 0.25 on here? Yes, we have. There we go, look. Very limited number of feeler gauges on this one. Okay, let's do the same task again then. Yep, still plenty of clearance. And... There we go, down this side. No, oh, that one's tight. So there's between 0 0.2 and 0 0.25, so that's still in spec. Okay, let's go up again on this side. So we need 0 0.3 now if we've got one. No. So we'll have to do 0 0.2 and 0 0.1, a combination. There's point one and point two. Right. Let's get rid of all these because they're quite delicate and I've already broken one of them. Make sure they're nice and clean. Okay. Let's give that a go. Yeah, still plenty of clearance. Getting close, aren't we? 0.4 was the maximum. So, how are we going to do 0.4? Uh, there we go, look. 0 0.15, 0 0.05, and 0.2. In fact, let's minute drop it down. So 0 0.25 and 0 0.15. So we just have to use two filler gauges. A bit fiddly. Right. Okay, so we've got a 0 0.15 and a 0 0.25. So this is the maximum air gap that's permissible on this distributor, as per the Toyota specs at least. Oh, yeah, that's tight. Okay, cool. Right, good. Only just good. Right, so the air gaps on all three of these pickups. This is the uh, the NE pickup, and then you've got the G1 and G2. I'm not too sure which one's which, but you've got G1 and G2 here. Three pickups, air gaps are all a pass. Super. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Well, we've checked a lot of stuff, and the one thing we haven't checked yet, as per the manual, is the igniter. But I've already bench tested that. I know that's good. If worse comes to worst, I still have somewhere the old RAV4 igniter, which is the same pin layout. I think we even tried it on the car and the car ran on the previous problem. So if it is an igniter fault, I do have a known good igniter that should run that engine, even though it's not specifically designed for that model. It's very similar. I think um, what I like to do now is to get the Pico scope out, reinstall the distributor back into the engine, plumb it all up, and then run the Pico scope off the ECU pins that relate to G1, G2, and of course the NE output. That's the three different outputs from the little pickup coils in that distributor. Now I'm pretty confident that the ECU is going to use the NE pickup for the actual spark, but I'm not entirely sure to be honest. I'll have to check a wiring diagram. But um, I'm going to take a few minutes out, refit the dizzy. You don't really need to see that. It's going to be a long video, this one, as it is. Uh, and then I'll get the uh, oscilloscope set up and we'll see if we can get some kind of 
captured waveforms and see if it just drops out on one of those coils once the engine has fired a couple of times. And if it does, then that's why the engine's stalling out. And we'll need a new dizzy. Now I know it's passed the resistance checks and it's passed the air gap check, but that's not conclusive. You know, coils, windings can fail um, with heat. And don't forget that engine ran the first time I started it for about three or four minutes. So everything's warming up during that period. And when you've got a coil of wire and as it warms up, that's when you can get a break in the wire and it cools back down again and the wire touches again. So maybe, just maybe, that could be the fault. I don't know. Right, time to get grubby. I'm going to refit that dizzy. Catch you later. Okay, so we're going to measure the three outputs one at a time of the distributor, the signals that go to the ECU to control ignition and of course injectors as well actually if we were to make a decision on those. So we've got NE, G1 and G2 and if we look down here on the pin diagram we've got NE just here, we've got G1 and G2 and G- minus is just a ground so we can just go to, to you know the body on the vehicle for the ground for the probe. So we'll do NE first, I think. Capture the waveform on that. Right, so NE is the big plug, top right. Perfect. Okay, Houston, it appears we have a bit of a problem because on that wiring diagram, on the pin layout, it was telling us that NE is this pin here, is this uh, pin here, and there's no wire. Now, Toyota have a habit of moving these wires around based on you know, various years and models of these MR2s. It turns out that the ECU we've got and the wiring harness in this vehicle is very slightly different to what's in the service manual. So, I do know if we take the lid off this, MR, off this uh, ECU, on the actual circuit board inside it has all the pins labelled up. So we'll do that. We'll pull it out of the vehicle, stick it on the bench, and we'll work out which pins relate to that distributor. Right, here we go. Probably never been disconnected in their entire life. Where's that screwdriver? There you go, it's one. Get it out of the way. So, come on, mister. You can do it. There we go. Right, to the bench. Right, so this is ECU part number 89661-17350, and it's for a 3S-G manual transmission. Okay, here we go. Nothing's ever easy these days, is it? Give me a set of points and a carburetor, eh? Right. Okay, one lid. Well, it looks nice and clean in there. Okay, we'll do a close-up. Right, you can see, labelled all along those pins are basically all the inputs and outputs. There's E01, top right, look there. So, where the hell is any? Oh, there it is, look. There's any. So, any is, by the looks of it, the fourth pin up on that large plug. So, it was the same plug, just a different position. All right, and we also want, what was it? G1 and G2, which is there, look. Right next to any for G2, and G1 
Jeez, camera work's terrible, Mr. Young. So, without touching things, we've got any just there, G2 just there, and then the one inboard is G1. And that's the three pins are after. Fantastic. Right, I'll label those up on the outside. Maybe even make a little dry diagram, I think. And then we know where to test from. Perfect. So, NE is, I'm trying to touch the pen, so we've got one, my side's terrible, one, two, three, four. So that pin there is NE. So, on here, that'll be that pin there. Okay, and then the one next to it will be G1. Which is, so that's NE, that pin there, look, that one's G1, and that one down there is G2. So we can write G2 on there. G2. And the cover's going to, so I'll put the cover on, and I'll label these two up. So we've got those two pins, and that's N, and that's G1. That's how it works, doesn't it? Just very Yorkshire. Right. Thanks, Toyota. Okay, we'll put the cover on that way around, then we've got plenty of room to write. Don't think it matters too much. I never thought this morning when I came outside to the workshop I'd be taking an ECU cover off. I really didn't think that. But hey, isn't that what, what keeps life interesting? I reckon so. Right, so pin four. N, E. And then pin five. G1. Yeah, cool. And on this side, pin five, which is one, two, three, four, five, which is where that line is there. G2. Oh, well, I reckon we can work that out now. Okay. Picoscope, here we come. Right, said Fred. Let's plug this thing back in. What I'd like to do is actually work out what the coloured wires are, just for reference for future. Put all those in. Okay, so the fourth pin along for NE is that black. <laughs> almost thought there wasn't one there for a second. Is that black wire? Okay, so I'm making out that black is NE. And then uh, G2, uh, G1 was next to it. So that's this wire here, which is it just white? Let's have a look, has it got a tracer on it? That looks pretty white to me. Okay, so G1 is white, and then G2 is the one opposite the white one. So, it's never easy. What have we got? It looks like it's a green. There's the black. Yeah. Green, it's that one there, look. Excellent. Okay, so we'll plug that in. More we'll back probe N E. The white wire. Black wire. I'm an idiot. Okay, so we're going to back probe any, which is the black wire here. Pretty sure you're going to go any further than that. 
mister. Doesn't feel very solid. Which is usually about the time when I stab myself. And that, that's it. Okay, right, warm picoscope. So we'll hook him on there. And he needs a ground, so we'll stick the ground on the body there, look. Right, time to get some signals. Right, we'll start the picoscope up. Click. Okay. Right, so we need to do some settings first. So we'll go for plus or minus 5 volts DC. And let's go for 500 millisecond divisions. Cool. Okay, we'll stop that. Right. We're going to go and crank it. And as soon as it's stalled, well, once it's stalled, I'll turn the ignition off. We'll see what we get. Right, where are we? Oh, there we go, look, page two. Right, so it only ran, geez, okay, so we've got cranking period, engine starts, RPM increases, and then instantly the engine starts to stall, and then we get basically no output. And all that happens in a period of, well, that's like one second, not even two seconds. Yeah, almost two seconds during that period. Okay, what I'm going to do this time is keep cranking even after it's stalled. So I'm just going to hold the key on crank because then we know the distributor's turning and it should be giving us an output signal. Okay, so we'll save that one. Right. Uh, oh, there we go, look. Right, one from previous. Okay, so uh, this is any waveform or any signal from distributor. Normal. So the engine stalled. Right, save that. Get rid of our overview. Don't need that. Right, so we'll do another one now, and this time I'll just keep cranking. And I'll keep it cranking for maybe five or six seconds, and then we can see if it still loses signal. So we should get a much longer waveform because that distributor should keep giving a signal out. There we go, look. Okay, brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted to see. So in this area here, obviously that's cranking, engine fired, engine stalled, cranking again, and it did actually try to start for a second time. And this is again just the standard sort of cranking waveform that, that any pickup coil will give. You know, cranking RPM. That's really cool. Okay, how does it finish off? There we go, look. And this is me stopping cranking and the engine slowly grinding to a halt. So we know what the waveform looks like now. We can recognize certain parts of it. Okay, let's save that one. So let's go with that and then we'll just keep cranking. We'll call it keep cranking at the end. So we know that, that that pickup coil is giving a continuous output. That looks pretty good. Right, let's move across to G1. That's one of the um, one of the other coils. <clears throat> this is going swimmingly well now. 
Right, so now we need to go on to G1, which is the white wire right next to the black. Pop that down there. Clip our little clippy thing on. Right, so we're on the G1 wire now. That's the white wire. And uh, we'll just press play. And I'm going to do the same thing. We'll do a normal crank, let it stall first, and see what we get. Okay. Oh wow. Now obviously we're going to get a lot less uh, peaks on this because it's it's a single peak on one four three sixty. So each one of these signals, each one of these peaks, is uh, basically one complete revolution of the camshaft, not the crankshaft, the camshaft. Okay. So how's it look? Well, that looks okay, I think. I don't see a problem with that. So here we're cranking. We're just starting to crank the engine. That's the first pulse, because the engine's turning quite slowly at this point. And then it does fire a little bit. It coughs. So we see that the voltage spikes up. And then this is obviously the noise in between each of the pulses. And of course, the engine's stalling now and grinding to a halt. So that, that sensor's giving an output. Right. Let's save that one. Okay, so this is G1 signal. I'm going to distribute a normal because we allowed the engine to store and stop turning. Right, we'll save that. Get rid of our overview. Don't need that. Okay, yeah, we'll just clear that off. Right, and we're going continue to crank we'll start the engine obviously it'll start but i'll keep cranking for about five seconds and we'll see what happens to the signal right i'm back and it, again, it coughed again, didn't it? There we go. Look, we can see that. So we've got initial, um, you know, revolutions of the camshaft. The engine starts, stalls, coughs again, and then continues to just be cranked. So that's crank speed output over here. And this is a cough. And this is the, the bigger sort of engine start here. So again, it's giving us a continuous output signal. Now, what I don't know is what the minimum voltage output permissible is for the ECU to recognize it. I just don't know. Um, but we do have G2 to test. And I think G2 and G1 have both got the same windings because uh, they both have the same resistance. So we should get the same kind of signal from G2. If we get a different signal, then we know there's a problem with one of those windings. Right, we'll save this one. It's always good to save. Right, so that's that one. And then we change the end to keep cranking. Ivan's going to have a laugh at this, isn't he? Hi, Ivan. Right, save that. Okay, we'll clear that off. And we need to move the wire. So we need to go on to G2 now. Okay, last one. So this time we're going to go on to that green, which is down below. A bit harder to get to. But it's that one there. If we can get in. There it is. Perfect. Right, little clip. Oh, yep, that's on. Right, okay, we'll test the signal for G2 now. So we'll just start that up and I'll uh, just do a normal crank, engine will start, and then we'll let it stall. Here we go. Right, see what we got. 
Okay, it's spread across two pages. Great. Okay, so this is the, the, the camshaft just starting to turn. And then, of course, we get some spikes. And, of course, the engine now is stalling. The engine's slowing down, coming to a halt. And then, of course, it flatlines because the engine's not rotating anymore. Right, okay. Well, that looks very similar to G1, so we'll save that. We'll save it as G2. Normal, there we go, right. Brilliant, okay, so we'll just clear that off. Right, we'll go and do a continuous crank now and see what we get. Okay, it tried to start right at the end, didn't it? Okay, so again we've got flat line. I turn the start, turn the ignition key to start to crank the engine. There's your first slow revolution of the camshaft. Engine fires, RPM picks up, engine stalls, and this is just the continuous crank as I'm holding it on the starter motor. It's pretty good. Okay, well that looks to me very similar to um, G1, doesn't it? Okay, we'll save that, because I always forget to save the last one. Right, G2, Let's keep cranking. Save. Whew. Okay, crew, well, I'm running out of time today. I've been outside most of the day doing this filming. And obviously I do a bit more, you know, off camera as well. But um, it looks to me like that distributor checks out just fine. So where are we going to go from here? Well, before I sign off for today, I'd like to do an injector waveform. I want to see if it keeps injecting fuel even after the engine has stalled whilst I'm cranking. Let's find out. Because I want to know why this engine is stalling. Is it stalling because there's no spark? the sparks getting, getting cut you know or is it stalling because the injectors not opening anymore that should give us some more ideas right I opened up the uh, case again just to make sure because I can't believe that diagram anymore and we've got a couple of injectors one is yellow one's blue and then the other two are on the opposite side which is what is it red and green so we can go in at a red one that's nice easy one to get to Hopefully. Can't be a good bit of back probing. Right, there we go. Okay. Mr. Picar scope, hook him on there. Give him a ground. Right, good to go. Right, we'll just clear that. Now we have to go for full voltage on this one. It's probably going to go off the scale as well, unfortunately. We can give it a go. Okay, and if I click that to times 10. Okay, let's see what the injectors are doing. Right, that was the injector's waveform, or an injector waveform, allowing the engine to stall. What have we got? Have we got a real waveform? We have, it's pretty poor quality, isn't it? There we go, look. Okay, well, we can see that there is a pulse, but that particular injector, there was only three pulses. So we've got here, you know, engine ignition's turned off, ignition goes on, I'm cranking now, get our first pulse, second pulse, third pulse is quicker because the engine is now spinning faster, and then there's no more pulses. 
Three pulses. Jeez, that's not a lot. So that's only six revolutions of a crank. Huh, that's pretty quick. Okay, we'll save that one. And, uh, right, save as. Okay. Injector. Pulse. Normal. Okay, save. Right, we're going to do exactly the same test again now, but this time I'm going to keep cranking and we'll see if we continue to get an injector pulse. Here we go. Poor old car, needs a battery charging up. Right, let's have a look back and see what we get. And we only got three pulses on the first one after it's stalled. And look again, we've only got three pulses. And even though I'm cranking, we're getting nothing. This engine is stalling because there's no fuel. But we should also check we continue to get spark. On the HT leads. That's an easy one to do. Right, so the quickest way, because I'm running out of time desperately now, I'm in so much trouble, uh, I've just rigged up um, a strobe light onto one of the HT leads, and the strobe light's powered by a battery, so we'll do a crank and we'll see if it continues to flash. If it does, we know we're, gonna, we're getting continuous spark. If it only flashes two or three times, like the pulse on the injectors, then we also know that the ECU is cutting the spark as well, for whatever reason. Stupid car! Wow. I saw a lot more than three flashes going on there. Okay, I'll do the same test again, but I'm going to keep cranking this time, just like I did with the uh, distributor coil tests. I think the battery is trying to sell me something. Right, let's have a look. Okay, I have no idea how this video is going to be, but we have come to the end for this particular episode. What do we know? Well, everything we checked works out just fine. That was, you know, all the wiring at the start of the video, the uh, main ignition relay, um, you know, the grounds, the ECU, all that kind of stuff was fine other than that first test, which we shouldn't have got a voltage, but we did. But I think we were on the wrong pin. Knowing now what we know about that ECU and the pin configuration, it doesn't match the manual. So I'm going to just put that to one side. Yes, I could redo the test, but I'm not going to bother. I run out of time at the moment. We do know conclusively that we're losing injector pulse. We don't know why, but we know it's not there. We're only getting sort of three pulses then the engine's stalling. Even if we keep cranking the engine, we don't get any more fuel. We don't get any more pulses. So that could well be the reason why this engine's stalling out. We do know conclusively we continue to get spark whilst we're cranking. We saw the strobe continue to flash while I was cranking, despite the battery being critically low at the moment. Okay, well, I've given you lots of information on this video. You've seen the manual. You've seen lots of pages of the manual on the video too. What do you think it could be? Because I've got to fix this car. What could be stopping the or causing the ECU to stop pulsing those injectors, but still keep giving a spark? So I'm not looking at the ignition system at all anymore. I'm now going back to the fuel system. Wow, bit of a turnaround, wasn't it? Okay, crew. Well, if you found this video interesting and helpful, who knows? Why not click on subscribe? You'll see a little gear icon turn up, click on the gear icon, and then you can tick the box and turn on notifications. You'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and Twitter. Feel free to communicate through any of those portals, whichever you wish. But I would prefer, if you don't mind, first point of contact through the comments on YouTube. Because let's face it, that's where the videos are. 
Okay, crew, I've got a shed load of packing up to do, and I'm going to go and watch the Grand Tour. See you guys. Cheers. Over and out.